Alright people, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification. That way you'll know when I upload the next video and you'll be supporting my channel. Follow me on Twitter. Every time I upload a new video, I'll be tweeting. Ladies and gents, home to reacts, and this is How Did Britain Conquer India? Animated History by the channel, the one and only Armchair Historian. I love this channel. I've been reacting to this channel for past year, here and now, I guess, you know, certain videos. Uh, I like how how great detail and animation he goes into, so it's gonna be fun. Remember, people, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, so, I wish I to react to more, and you'll be supporting my channel. It will help algorithm or something. You, apparently YouTube is not sending much impressions nowadays after the strike and week of a gap, but yeah. Uh, check out the Rick Sunday, there's a link in the description, check out the cards, check out the ink cards, and yeah, that's what it. This video was made possible by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, online store, or website, make it with Squarespace. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. Today's episode, how the British Empire was able to assert control over India. Okay, it's an intro. The Indian subcontinent was subjugated by an island more than 20 times smaller in size. This unimaginable conquest of what would become the jewel in the British crown greatly empowered the British Empire. By the middle of the 19th century, British rule led to a new wave of South Asian nationalist movements, the effects to which are still felt to this day. But we're not going to be delving into too much detail about the consequences of British rule. Rather, our goal is to evaluate what actions taken by the British and Indians alike paved the way for British rule in the first place. In order to understand how the British were able to take control of India, we need to go back to New Year's Eve on 1600, well into the reign of Elizabeth I. It was her signature on a royal charter granted to a group of adventure merchants, later known as the East India Company, that would change the destinies of two nations forever. However, at the time, the company's leaders were not yet interested in trading directly with the reigning Indian power of the time. Instead, they focused on competing with the Dutch, French, and Portuguese in the East Indies. But over time, the East India Company, after being driven out of the East Indies, shifted its focus onto the Indian subcontinent. In 1640, a company representative succeeded in securing a grant of land in southern India, a pivotal moment as it marked the first time that Indian land was owned directly by the English. It was Okay, let's be honest. East India made a shit ton of money after, you know, coming to India. So they were driven out of East Indies, like Indonesia and everywhere. So they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, you don't want us? We're gonna go to India and make money. <laughs> it was on this land that they constructed Fort St. George. The settlement that grew around this region became the thriving city of Madras, now known yeah, Madras. as Chennai, and home to over 7 million people. As more and more company-owned forts and settlements sprang up all over the Indian subcontinent, the English became a leading exporter of spices, which, in the words of Brian Gardner, author of the East India Company, had a considerable place in life. Men were prepared to die in search of them, and many did. No gift was more acceptable, and to be well supplied was a mark of status. Wealth could be measured in spices. Yeah, it's commodity. The French, Danish, and Dutch all became similarly active in Indian affairs from the 17th century onwards, with the Portuguese already established in the region. Joining me now is our good friend History with Hilbert, who will be providing us with some background information on the Mughal Empire. As the 18th century commenced, the Europeans became increasingly involved in Indian affairs. They could afford to, because the Mughal Empire, which once ruled over not just the majority of India, but also parts of modern-day Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh, was on the decline in the wake of very costly wars of conquest. The Mughals suffered from repeated invasions by Persians, Afghans, and other Indians. In 1739, Maratas. the Mughal capital, Delhi, was sacked by the Persian ruler Nader Shah, following the decisive Battle of Kurnal, and in 1748, 
Nader Shah's protege, the Afghan Ahmed Shah Durrani, also led his armies into Mughal territory beginning his own invasion. Due to these factors, by the middle of the 18th century, the Mughal Emperor took the role of a figurehead to many new empowered local rulers. If you'd like to check out my video that goes into more detail about the Mughals, then follow the link in the description below. Thanks for joining us again, Halbert. As the Mughals weakened, the Maratha Kingdom in the central west of India was carving out an empire of its own. Despite never eclipsing the Mughal Empire at its height, the Maratha Empire remained as a dominant power in India for another 80 years or so. As all of this was happening, the East India Company began to overshadow its European competitors, devoting substantial profits to raising a private army in an effort to contend with the Maratha Empire and Bengal. By now, the East India Company benefited greatly from the country's imposing navy, which enabled it to ferry more and more men to India than its European competitors. As much as the company's military- mm, That is so true, right? East India Company was a kind of newer at the time, while every other European country were like Portugal and others were already there. But British Navy being the most powerful definitely helped them out with the lots of goods and transportation and things like that. And obviously then they, I guess, played the, you know, more sinister side, sinister side of, I guess, East India Company, right? They went, uh, you know, a bit plotting because it's much easier to conquer India because simple rule of, you know, divide and conquer. Since there is Mughal Empire, there is Maratha, there is, you know, people in the south that are kind of, you know, growing their own movement. Uh, India is fragmented at this point, right? Uh, different empires. People say, you know, India as a whole wasn't a thing, which is not true. One Indian nation, like one empire wasn't a thing, but anything beyond Indus River was considered India. That's where the name comes from. And, if, you know, even in the ancient scriptures, it says Bharata as a whole region. People recognize that, but it wasn't one empire, like how Japan was, how China was with, the, with its dynasty, right? When the British came, it was very fragmented, which made it much easier for East India Company to, I guess, divide and conquer a certain place, right? Manipulate people aided in its growth, it was the laissez-faire policy that won over many local rulers to their side, many of whom benefited financially from their dealings with the company and did not perceive their sovereignty to be at risk. Of all the Europeans who had established themselves in India, the British and French based in the south were now preeminent. But under the daring Robert Clive, the British East India Company's army was able to defeat both the Bengalese and their French allies at the Battle of Plassey during the Seven Years' War, which, by the 1760s, allowed them to assert control over much of the Indian subcontinent unchecked through direct territorial possession or indirect tributary arrangements. To quote Gardner once more, by the Treaty of Paris 1763, the French forts taken by the company were returned to them, some of them having been razed to the ground. But the French never recovered, and only six years later, the French East India Company collapsed, although the stations remained in the possession of France. During the British advance into the Indian heartland, it encountered staunch resistance from the Sikh Empire and other Indian states not interested in doing business with the English. The Duke of Wellington, who would later go on to defeat Napoleon, won several victories against the states while aiding his brother Richard Wellesley, who acted as Governor General of India. Consequently, by the turn of the 19th century, the Wellesley brothers had succeeded in leaving behind them the foundations of an empire greater even than that of Akbar himself. As the middle of the 19th century drew was... closer, an Indian national consciousness- Okay, I'm Jerry Stern pulling a joke. That was the different. <laughs> but yeah, that is so perfect, right? Akbar and the Star Wars reference. <laughs> yeah, Akbar, Akbar was at really at height in the Mughal Empire. This began to take form, as company rule resulted in a wider array of social and economic reforms being demanded from increasingly alienated local rulers. These sentiments culminated in the Indian Rebellion of 1857, also known as the Sepoy Mutiny, which was brutally suppressed and concluded with the formal dissolution of the Mughal Empire and the transfer of power from the British East India Company to Britain itself. Power yeah. now rested in the hands of the British Crown directly, and as the 19th century continued, India's resources and the livelihoods of its people were exploited to fuel the Industrial Revolution in Britain, leading to a series of famines which shook the Indian economy to the core and left millions of Indians dead. 
One thing was certain, the British Empire now had millions of new subjects under its rule in India, and imperial expansion wouldn't stop there. To conclude, the political vacuum left by the Mughal Empire in the wake of repeated invasions, the failure of other Indian states, particularly the Maratha Empire, to fill that vacuum and unify India, the failure yeah, the famine thing was such a horrendous thing, right? Those photos you see, uh, that's just horrible. Every time I see those photos, like, what the fuck? The handling of the famine and, you know, not caring about the human lives at the time, right? Was uh, really fucked up. I guess that fueled the anger in India a lot more. Uh, you know, even people say that, you know, for Indians, uh, Churchill was much bigger evil than Hitler for that reason. Failure of other European powers to stop the British, Britain's military and industrial superiority, and the governing policy of the East India Company allowed Britain to take over the Indian subcontinent. Yeah. So I guess the famine historia was a different one. I guess uh, since it was probably was 1919 before that, and Churchill famine was pretty later on. But yeah, it's uh, multiple times basically shit like that happened. And people got angrier and angrier. That's why, you know, multiple revolt happened during the time. Because it's just fucked up. When you see those images, like, holy shit, entire families are literally starving, can't even move, this, you know, fucking months old babies. You can only see bones and skin. That's just, that's just hard to process. Now back to our sponsor. Recently, Squarespace has made my life a lot easier. This website building platform offers a wide array of customizable design templates to get started with. Eight new ones have been released in this year alone. From that point, its intuitive interface and diverse toolkit allow virtually anyone to build a website. You really don't need to be computer savvy or an artist to do this stuff. But should you have any questions, the reliable customer support team is always there to provide answers. With all of this in mind, we highly recommend you use Squarespace for any website project imaginable, be it for school, work, or just for fun. Check out Squarespace and register for a free trial using squarespace.com slash armchairhistorian. It's as easy as clicking the link in the description below and getting started. When you're ready to launch, use the offer code armchair for a 10% discount on your first website or domain purchase. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank- Alright. <laughs> so yeah, how did Britain conquer India? In simple terms, like I said, uh, you know, the India was fragmented. There was no one singular empire, different- small empires were ruling it and beyond that even among those empire local rulers were also a bit scared of the different empire taking over so all the local rulers were scared and when the britain came right like we are here we'll support you if you do business with us uh, that give them the comfortable escape that they need like holy shit britain is behind us right no other empire is going to take us down britain is behind us so it made it much easier for britain to slowly take over places one after another whenever they went to a place small ruler of that welcomed them with open arms you know because they know it's you know britain basically uh, first of all fucking with them is not going to be great and the local ruler was scared of you know the nearest empire that is trying to take over his place Right. If someone in the, you know, I guess uh, he, they went to the Mughal Empire, you know, city or something. While well, that is occupied by Mughal Empire, they were scared. Like holy shit, Maratha is just at the border. So it became much easier. You know, divide and conquer was much easier that way. If it was singular empire, like one, like say, uh, if. Uh, you know, Mughals, you know, like how Mughal was under the Akbar, one strong leader. If it was like that and whole India was under just one there without any opposition, it would have been much harder for Britain to take over, right? Like how it happened in China and Japan. But if, it, obviously, Britain being so advanced at the time, if they had put all the resources in, it probably would have taken over India, just like they could have taken over China or any other place too. But it would have been much harder than it was. Alright people, that was How Did Britain Conquer India by the channel Amchar Historian. If you like my accent, don't forget to like, subscribe. Check out the Rick Sunday, they're selling here this season. Check out the Kazakh of the Kazakh. I'll see you next time.